The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to What Architects Should Know, the AIA Master Agreements and Service Orders webinar. This is a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. A few administrative items before we get started. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the AIA Contract Documents Learn page. It will also be emailed to you by close of business uh, Monday. So you will have the recording as well as the PowerPoint for reference. The PowerPoint is also uploaded under handouts in the webinar platform. So if you'd like, you can also uh, pull up the webinar from your GoToWebinar window. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws, and this program is also registered for one learning unit for AIA members. When you register to attend this program, you entered your AIA member ID. We'll use that information to report your credit within two business weeks uh, to the AIA directly. A disclaimer here that this program is provided by the AIA for informational purposes only. This information is not provided as legal advice, and we always recommend that you um, uh, that, that you follow up with legal counsel. And now I'm going to turn it over to one of our presenters, Donovan, to introduce himself. Donovan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. My name is Donovan Olip. I'm an Assistant General Counsel with HOK. I've been with HOK the last 13 years. And before that, I was a private practice lawyer for about five years, practicing construction law. And before that, an architect for about eight years. So all of that to say uh, my entire career has been in design and construction. Uh, since 2016, I've also had the privilege of serving on the Contract Documents uh, Committee. Thanks, Donovan. Um, and my name is uh, James Germano. I'm Donovan's co-presenter today. Uh, I am a manager and counsel with the AIA, working with the Contract Documents Program uh, and also the risk management program, although for today's purposes, um, focusing more on the contract documents program. Um, before coming to the AIA, I was an attorney in private practice in the DC area doing construction um, litigation, contract negotiations, claims, uh, and also just sort of general civil litigation. Um, did that for about seven years before uh, coming to the AIA. Uh, and with that, Let's go ahead and get into the substance of today's webinar, which is why all of you are here. So the learning objectives for today are fourfold. Um, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna help you understand the contractual model of master agreements. So really getting into how the master agreement and task order model can be used to establish repeat business with your clients. And we'll kind of go over how the master agreement and service order um, and task orders are set up uh, such that they can allow you to develop uh, and more easily transition between repeat business and repeat clients. We will also explore how the master agreement and task order contractual model can be used to streamline the contracting process um, with consultants that you use most often, so sort of looking downstream a little bit, uh, and also the same concept would apply to owners and clients uh, with whom you contract often as well. Third, we're going to examine uh, in detail the B121, which is the standard form of a master agreement between owner and architect. And we'll also get into detail a little bit in the, um, the C421, which is the standard form of master agreement between architect and consultant. Uh, and of course, we will look at the relevant service orders that apply to both of those um, and sort of help you understand how to use these documents properly and effectively. And we will also get in a little bit to the differences between these documents and, for example, the B101, uh, which is the sort of the standard owner architect agreement with which uh, many of you may be familiar. 
Uh, and lastly, um, we're going to help you know where to get AI resources, tools, and guides uh, that we've developed to assist you in understanding uh, contract and risk management issues. So if you have further questions or ever have a question about master agreements or anything related to AI documents, you'll know where to go get some more information. So first, a little bit of background about the AI contract documents program. We won't spend too much time on this, but it's important to know how these documents come about um, because as you're using them, they sort of will frame some issues uh, for you. So the contract documents program has a longstanding history. It's been around since 1888. And actually the document that you're seeing on the right-hand side of your screen is the actual first document that was created by the AIA. It was an, it was an owner contractor agreement uh, in 1888. Um, the, the reason that these contracts were created was to sort of standardize the legal forms in the industry and make design and construction transactions more predictable. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s to really create a standard set of language that can be used throughout the industry to make it more predictable um, and therefore a little bit less risky. Uh, the AIA now offers uh, nearly 200 agreements and forms. Um, so what makes the AI documents the industry standard? Um, in addition to the widespread use of these documents, it's the volume of case law uh, and precedent that's incorporated into these documents. So with each revision uh, of these documents, and I'll explain what I mean by revision in a little bit, uh, the um, design, construction, and legal professions evaluate the new or revised or proposed language uh, and adapt it uh, as best practices for the industry uh, using precedent uh, or case history that may have come about in the last five to ten years to really look at how courts are evaluating you know, any new language that comes about. Um, so the, the goal, of course, is to allocate risk to the party best able to manage and control that risk. Um, and then, so maybe a minute here, just talking about the drafting process, and then we'll move on, get into the details of the master agreements. Um, and the drafting process, as I'm sure many of you know, um, every AIA contract and agreement and form has a year after it. So today we're talking about, you know, for example, the B121-2018. And what that means is that that agreement was published first in 2018. Um, and typically the AI documents are updated on a 10 year cycle. Um, and a couple of years before the document is up, the AI contract documents committee that Donovan referenced and of which Donovan is a member uh, will begin to look at that document and they will uh, coalesce and collate market research industry stakeholder um, opinions and information, uh, AI member resources, liaison information. They will contact subject matter experts, um, user information. So if somebody is using a contract, they can submit an inquiry and say, hey, why is this worded a certain way? And all of that is taken into consideration. And then the contract is updated over a one or two or even a three year process to create it over the end of that 10 year cycle. Uh, and of course, the AI Contract Documents Committee is that volunteer committee uh, on which Donovan is a member, uh, which is a diverse group of volunteers who work across the U.S. and they represent and consist of architects, uh, owners, owners representatives, um, contractors representatives, insurance uh, and outside legal counsel. Uh, and they all are part of the committee for a 10 year cycle, which sort of coincides with the 10 year cycle uh, on which we revise our documents. Uh, and with that, without further ado, let's get into the, the meat of the master agreements. So the overview of today can sort of be broken down into two big ticket items. Uh, and those are the first, it's important to understand that the substance of the master agreement is similar to your typical AIA contract. So we're going to be referencing a lot the B101, for example, because that's sort of the agreement that's perhaps most uh, similar to the, the master agreement between owner architect, but the structure is different. Uh, and we'll get into some ways that it's different and some ways that it's the same. The differences in the structure and some of the differences in the substance mostly lie in the sections related to insurance, uh, substantial and final completion, uh, and then also payment. So, I want to show you here uh, what you're looking at on your screen. I'll show you sort of the difference between the structure of 
a standard agreement uh, and then how the master agreement is set up. So this is probably what you're more traditionally used to seeing, whether you're an architect or an owner or you know, a contractor or a consultant uh, and there's you know, architects on your project, you're probably familiar with this contract setup. So you might have a standard contract for your standard project. I'm calling it project number one. Uh, and this is between an owner and an architect. And this is how you might set it up. So you have a B101 and that's your owner architect agreement. And you might attach to it, for example, the B201 for design and construction contract administration services. And together they form the contract for this first project. Well, let's say that you have a similar project for the same client, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. Well, that would look like this, it's the same thing. Uh, so for the second project, you're looking again at a B101 and a B201, for example, or whatever, you know, phase or scope of work uh, you decide to do but you're still looking at the same two documents and together these two documents are uh, roughly 40 pages or so I think um, maybe more than that uh, and you have to renegotiate both every time uh, or even if you don't renegotiate them you still have to essentially come to an agreement that you might use the same terms uh, or you know different terms or whatever the case may be the master agreement set up which I'll show you here on the next slide is designed to streamline this process so this is the master agreement owner architect uh, framework and it might look a little convoluted at first because there's sort of more you know documents on your screen right now but it's meant to streamline the process so first the document all the way on the right is the b121 that's your standard form of master agreement between owner and architect for services provided under multiple service orders that's the long title we're gonna call it the master agreement, or sometimes you might hear us refer to it as an MSA, master service agreement. That's the document that you typically agree to first. So that's the one that has your standard terms and conditions. And in a few slides, we'll get into the, the highlights of what the standard terms and conditions usually are. And then for each project, the only thing you have to do is pull up a B221, which is your service order. It's essentially your scope document and a few more terms uh, and agree to it. And each of those projects now tie back to and incorporate the B121. So if you have one client with repeat business or if you have one project with different phases, you can potentially use it for that as well with a few very minor modifications. Um, and you can have this type of setup where you streamline the contracting process and then all those standard terms and conditions flow through to each of these. So it just makes it a little bit more predictable. You don't have to think during the, you know, the second project or the third project. Well, you know, for this project, how many days do we have to give notice of a claim or what day of the month are we supposed to get paid on or you know, what are our insurance requirements? You know, some, some of those are, can be project specific, but the big ticket items are consistent. So it allows you to build some consistency in your practice uh, and develop an ease of repeat business. And I'm sure that makes life a lot easier on all parties involved, not just architects, of course, it can make life easier on owners uh, as well. So with that, I will, hand the microphone over to Donovan, who can talk a little bit about getting into the, the details and the substance of what is a master agreement. Donovan? Yeah, thank you. So before we go into what a master agreement, you know, what the details are, I thought it would be helpful just to kind of give some context as to um, when master agreements are used. So at HOK, we see master agreements used whenever we have a single client who expects to do a significant amount of capital improvement over a specific period of time. And in a sense, it's a, it's a contract that we expect to have a long-term relationship with that client. Um, and some examples of where it often comes up is you might see it uh, where you have a client that has a very large project that has multiple phases or components. So it might be a, a hospital client with a um, multi-phase project where in phase one you might design the patient tower and garage and then phase two might be 
the medical office building that's associated with the hospital. So um, the the client, for various reasons, wants to stagger those two uh, developments, and and so they might use a master agreement to do that. Um, quite often, we see uh, master agreements in um, interiors and uh, what we call our workplace practice, where uh, clients, uh, we have a single national client that may have multiple locations and you might be uh, doing work at any one of those various locations. So, for example, a bank that has regional offices or branches that need to be either designed or renovated, uh, you then have a master agreement and service orders for each individual location. Another uh, uh, example of a master agreement might be a IDIQ contract. So uh, governments, especially the federal government, will might issue an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantities contract that says, you know, for a period of three years, we might order from you up to $5 million worth of design services, and these are the terms under which we'll do it. So that's, that's another form of a master agreement. Uh, what we've seen recently, uh, and I, I don't know that this is what a master agreement is intended for, but we have seen clients use them to manage even single projects where they might uh, authorize work on, uh, on a per phase basis. So you'll get a service order for schematic design, design development, contract documents, and CA. Um, that's that's not a favored approach. It tends to create havoc in how you calculate backlog, but um, it is it is a, a a method that we're seeing master agreements being used. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll we'll start talking about how how the agreement is broken down structurally. Uh, on um, the master agreement itself, as Jimmy pointed out, really creates, uh, sets out those core terms and conditions that will remain fixed for the duration of a contract. So there, there are terms and conditions that you don't want to have to go in and renegotiate every single time. So the idea is you get them negotiated once and they'll apply across the board for the series of contracts that you're, that you're contemplating. Um, and they will include the, the party's general responsibilities to the owner's responsibilities and the architect's responsibilities that are described, described in there. Uh, you'll have your dispute resolution and governing law provision, uh, how terminations are handled, copyrights, uh, insurance as well. So those terms that won't vary over the course of the uh, relationship are in the master agreement. And what's missing from the master agreement are the important uh, economic terms for architects, and that's what scope of services are we providing, uh, how will they be compensated, and what is generally the schedule, uh, whether it's just the completion or substantial completion or even a more detailed schedule. Uh, what I will say, it's very important uh, to recognize that there's, there's a, a balancing act that goes on in negotiating master agreements. Um, owners will tend to want to focus and get fixed in the, in the master agreement more terms such as rates, fees, services. Uh, architects, it's in our interest to have a more flexible process that allows us to adapt our fees and compensation to um, the individual project. So we'll talk about that as we move through the description of, um, of various parts, but that's, that's the, the, inner the uh, sort of conflict that's in play between in this document. So in the next slide, uh, we'll start talking about the, the master agreement and um, we can just go on into, uh, I'm sorry, the service order, and we'll just go into um, what a service order uh, does. So the, as we said, the master agreement has the, the fixed terms, but it doesn't really require the architect to do anything. Um, and in some IDIQ situations, it may be that the architect is never required to do anything, although that's, that's rare. Uh, 
the it's important to to um, uh, understand that service order is where everything really where the rubber meets the road. It's where everything comes together. Um, it's where you establish your compensation. Uh, you describe your services. You you have a schedule of sorts, whether it's just commencement and substantial completion or a more detailed schedule. That will be part of the service order. Um, it's rare, but you might have some additional insurance requirements depending on the complexity of the work that you're doing. Uh, you uh, may have different party representatives. I, I know at HOK, it's very common that the, the master agreement is negotiated between those individuals that hold the relationship between the client and the architect. But then those who actually carry out the work are uh, perhaps project managers and facility managers that, that are different. And so it gives you an opportunity to designate other uh, party representatives. And then it identifies the contract documents and that's a very important clause and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down to it. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that um, it's important to, to, to understand how a service order is incorporated into the master agreement. And in, um, in doing so, if you, if you um, in, in AIA's uh, B121, section 1.1, um, the master agreement is usually is uh, designated as being in effect for one year. And every master service agreement, uh, whether it's a client generated form or AIA document, has a term. That's something that's unique to, to master service agreements. And then it goes on to say that the master agreement applies to all service orders that are generated between the parties during that term. So it's important that you keep track of that term and make sure that that term is always in effect when work is ordered under it. Um, the the a, uh, B121 manages that process by providing an evergreen clause that allows for automatic renewal of the master service agreement unless either party gives notice of, of uh, termination 60 days prior to the renewal date. Um, and that renewal occurs annually. Um, so it's so one thing that's important to keep in mind that it might be good for the agreement to go on and on indefinitely. However, if you find yourself fit in a set of uh, terms or rates or some aspect of the agreement that's not beneficial to you, you wanna keep track of the a uh, 60 day deadline to be able to um, give notice of termination. Uh, two other things that are very important in, in the B121. One, the owner is not required to issue any service order. That's typical in most master service agreements. Um, however, uh, the architect may decline to accept any service order as well. And that's a key uh, protective feature for architects because um, you need to be able to look at the circumstances of each project, have a fee and a time for performance, be licensed in that jurisdiction to be able to provide those services, and, and you need to be able to look at that on a service order by service order basis. And if the client asks you to do something that you cannot do or doesn't make sense for you economically, um, you should have the right to decline a service order. So on the next slide, um, we'll look at at some of the uh, key terms. Uh, let's see. Am I still on the presentation? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay because it just disappeared from my screen and I'm not sure where it went. But anyway, uh, we'll go ahead. Uh, uh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no problem. Okay, so uh, we're, we're on the slide that says contract, comp oh, compensation. Um, we can, I can we go back one? Time. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there we go. Sorry about yep. that. I lost the presentation entirely. But anyway, here we are. No problem. One of the uh, many benefits time. of working from home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so contract time, uh, this 
this is uh, an important clause in the service order. It allows you to establish the time for performance. It's written in a way that's very similar to the B101, as um, Jimmy will get into more details on the differences and similarities, but this uh, allows you to establish at, at least the date for commencement of construction and substantial completion. However, if you wanted to add more detail about, you know, uh, the various phases and and time for completion, you could do so by referencing uh, a schedule, and and that's usually advisable as well. Next slide. So on that slide uh, is on Article Four of the service order is where you establish your compensation for the work um, being performed. Uh, it's important to note that in the master agreement, uh, section 9.1 says that the owner shall compensate the architect for services as described in the service order and pursuant to the service order terms. So here's where you would select whether it's a stipulated sum, percentage of construction costs or some other method. Uh, and also in 9.2 of the master agreement, uh, the arc the architect is required to establish hourly billing rates uh, for the architect and its consultants and those billing rates remain fixed for the duration of the term which is one year um, however there is a a nice clause in the aia document that does allow for increases to those rates based on the uh, architect's uh, typical review process so if there is a renewal, um, arguably, and you have an annual renewal of your rates, you should be able to increase it. You just have to be mindful of those clauses and the impact they have if owners try to strike them. Uh, you know, if, if you're locked into a set of rates for a long period of time, that, that's not going to work um, forever. So um, the other thing that is important in the uh, master service agreement is that the master agreement establishes default compensation for additional services, which are basically that they will be performed on an hourly basis um, according to the uh, uh, rates uh, described in the agreement. So if you go on, uh, let's see, if you go on to the next next slide then, if that doesn't work for, for you on a particular project, you do have an opportunity there to um, establish an alternative method for, for uh, compensation of additional services. Um, the master agreement in section 9.4 also identifies the typical reimbursable expenses that you would be used to having reimbursed in a uh, AIA document. If there are other unique expenses on a particular project, then you have an opportunity in the service order to identify those there. So the next slide. So the scope of services is interesting in um, in the service order in the service order form. It it really is just a fill-in point. Uh, so you can accomplish this in a couple ways. Maybe you are very confident in the way that you describe your services in your proposal. So this might be a good place to reference uh, your proposal of services for this particular project. A, uh, another way to address this issue is you might consider uh, referencing a B201 or a B252. The B201 is a form that describes the architect's basic services as you would typically expect them in an ordinary architecture, owner architect. AIA drafted owner architect agreement, and the B52 does the same for interior design services. Um, but however you want to have your services described, they, um, th this would be where you do that. On additional services, keep in mind that in section 4.2 of the master agreement, the, there is a list of typical additional, additional services uh, that you would expect in any AIA contract However, if there are other circumstances that are unique to a particular project that you feel might be additional, uh, should be considered additional services, then you would want to list them uh, here in section 2.1.2.
On the next slide, you'll see additional uh, insurance requirements. It's my experience, it's very rare that you have insurance requirements that vary from what's in the master agreement. Uh, Section 3.3 .3 of the master agreement establishes your minimum insurance requirements for general liability, auto liability, workers' comp, and professional liability. And that is the coverage that applies to the entire master agreement, meaning all projects ordered, ordered under that agreement, all service orders written under that agreement are um, subject to those uh, limits. It's not that you, know, you have uh, specific limits for each individual service order, it's, a, it's an aggregate. Um, so the next slide, party representatives. Uh, as, a, in, as I mentioned earlier, the master agreement actually identifies party representatives for the master agreement. Here, you can identify party representatives for each individual project. What I think is helpful in our master agreements is um, using those representatives that are identified in the master agreement as sort of senior uh, project reps who can deal with issues that may need to be elevated uh, before they get to dispute resolution. So if the project team is struggling with an issue, can't find a resolution, you have an additional layer of uh, executives on both sides that can try to work it out before you go into a formal dispute resolution process. Um, for smaller, uh, pro uh, you know, smaller firms, smaller organizations, you may not have the need for different uh, party representatives on a per project basis. Um, so you can just refer back to those parties that are identified in the master agreement. Attachments and exhibits. This is a, a very important clause. Um, it, it's, it's one that really defines uh, the particulars of each individual contract. Uh, you know, I was talking with Jimmy earlier when we were going over our slides, and it, it it seemed to me that you could almost fill out a service order completely, sign it, and you might have a binding contract just in the sense, in the way that this uh, particular clause incorporates by reference the B-121. Um, it would be helpful probably and, and advisable to be a little bit more specific about what B121 you're incorporating, you might do that by simply adding a, um, uh, a contract number or a date of contract that's been executed between the parties, just to be clear that it's not just an unmodified form, but it is one form that's been negotiated. Um, and then here's where you would list the B201 or B252 if you decided to use that, or you would list your proposal uh, which identifies um, your uh, scope of services and compensation, uh, and then any other documents if there's a client brief uh, or program that, that is relevant to the project, you would want to list it there as well. Um, and so that's generally the, the substance of a service order. Uh, on the next slide, you can see then how this works with the uh, master agreement, you would have the B-121, uh, which would have been negotiated at the beginning of the relationship. Um, and then you have the B-221 that is uh, negotiated at the time a project is ordered or authorized. And then it really takes uh, the 121 and 221 to create a binding contract. The 121 in itself um, is is not really much of a contract because it doesn't have the scope and compensation piece of it. And then as you go to the next slide, you can see how this might be expanded over a series of projects uh, to where you have um, the same terms and conditions applying over multiple service orders. One thing I would like to point out on this slide that I think is important, um, the uh, the, the master agreement, as it's written, uh, states that the, the order of precedence of documents are 
um, the, 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 the B221 will take precedence over the B121 um, if there's a conflict. So if you do write uh, terms and conditions into your your B221, um, you need to be mindful that they may modify the the B121 be, because of that order of precedence. And the reason I bring this up is that what we've seen with many of our large corporate clients is that they will, instead of using, say, the B221, they will use a purchase order. And in the purchase order, uh, may contain a lot of terms and conditions that really don't apply to our services or what we're doing. In fact, they're usually written for the procurement of goods, and they may have things like warranties for fitness for purpose or freedom from defects, uh, things that we absolutely would not agree to and that should not be incorporated into our um, uh, the, this B121 that we very carefully negotiated and made sure did not have those onerous terms. Um, and so uh, what, what's important is to understand how the, your client is going to order the services. And if you believe or you understand they're going to use a purchase order system, make sure that you add language into the B121 that says that the terms and conditions in any subsequent purchase order will have no effect on on the master agreement. Um, and this is another good slide for illustrating some of the risks associated with master agreements. Uh, I, I think they're very efficient tools. They're very effective for negotiating one contract and then moving forward with a, a series of projects. But you have to be mindful that if you don't get those terms right in the B121, you risk the chance of having a series of projects with really bad terms. So it's really important to get the terms right. I think the B121 does a good job with that. So now we'll go back to Jimmy, who will uh, do a comparison for you. Thanks, Donovan. Um, actually, I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind if I asked you a follow-up question, uh, so something you said kind of piqued my interest um, when you were talking about some of the risks of the B-121. And I was wondering um, if you could maybe explain your experience. I think it'd be helpful to our uh, attendees. Um, you had said something about when an owner um, offers jobs to, or, or, or you know, essentially presents an architect with a service order, under the terms of the master agreement, they have the ability to turn down work. And one of the reasons that you said an architect might do that was because maybe they're not licensed in that jurisdiction or, or something like that. So I was wondering if you, um, you know, at HOK or otherwise have experience with you know, cross-jurisdictional um, service order and master agreement issues and maybe how you navigated those. Uh, maybe you can just spend a minute or two explaining that to our attendees. I think that'd be really helpful. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. It's a, it's a, one of the more complex issues about doing uh, national uh, service agreements, and that is that uh, while while we have we are authorized to do business in every jurisdiction, we don't necessarily, and I, by jurisdiction I mean every state, we do not necessarily do that through the same company. So we might have in New York Helmuth Vada Kasselbaum PC, who operates in New York and a variety of other states, but if you go across the River to New Jersey, where HOK Architects Inc. If you go a little further west into Pennsylvania, HOK Architects Inc. If you go even further west um, into about 26 other states, all the way to California, where Helmut Tabata Kassenbaum Inc. So those names are addressed the myriad of professional licensing issues that arise with the various architectural boards. Um, and that's a whole nother presentation, but but what you want to make sure that you're doing is that you're writing service orders that conform to the requirements of the local jurisdiction. So, for example, we might write a master service agreement in the name of HOK Inc., but we make it very clear that each of our service orders are then executed 
and it may be executed in a different company's name depending on where the project is located. Um, and it's important to do that so that you, one, give the client notice of that fact because they're quite surprised when suddenly they're receiving invoices from one entity when they thought they had a contract with another. Um, but then the other reason is to make sure that you conform to the licensing requirements and you're, you're operating with the company that has the right certificate of authority in that jurisdiction. The other thing I'll say also is that uh, always make sure that you have a licensed architect who's in responsible charge in that jurisdiction. I know that goes without saying, but sometimes um, that gets lost in master service agreements and it's important to keep, keep that in mind not just your services, but those of your consultants who, you're, who are doing work under that contract as well. Thanks, Donovan. That was a great explanation. I think it's super uh, interesting and a really nuanced issue uh, that you know I certainly hadn't thought of not being in the field uh, doing these day to day uh, for sure. So um, going now to comparing a little bit of the differences between the master agreements of the B121 and 221 service order to some of the terms that uh, you all might be familiar with, uh, and that is the language of the B101. So assuming everyone just sort of has a general familiarity with the B101, I wanna just highlight some of the differences. This is not an exhaustive list, but it sort of gives you a good flavor of some of the nuanced differences. So um, one of the, things that might be might be a little obvious is, you know, in the B101, there's no direct mechanism for altering your insurance requirements while a project is ongoing. So when we're talking about insurance, your B101 has your insurance requirements for professional liability, for auto, for workers' comp, and you know, whatever the case may be. And that's set for the project. Uh, and as Donovan highlighted a little bit earlier, um, under the B121, 221, the insurance requirements contain, there are insurance requirements contained within both the B121, um, which are sort of your general overall requirements, and the B221, your, your service order, your project specific requirements. So under the B121, your master agreement, you're going to negotiate requirements for things like general liability, uh, auto, workers' comp, and PL. Uh, and then the B221, the service order for that particular project is, uh, as Donovan highlighted, is more open-ended and you can modify those insurance requirements or at least add to them if need be for that project. Um, but I think as Donovan said, that's usually relatively rare. Uh, another difference with insurance is the B101 insurance must be maintained until the termination of the agreement. Um, whereas it sort of naturally follows uh, under the B121 that if you agree to insurance requirements in the master agreement, you, you, those requirements are maintained until the termination of the master agreement. But if there's insurance requirements under a service order, the duration of those obviously can, um, can change depending upon how you structure those requirements. Um, and I will say just one quick aside, I did say that there's no direct mechanism for altering your insurance requirements while projects are ongoing under the B101. If you wanted to do that, you have to use like a G802, for example, to modify the agreement. So there, there is a way to do it, but it's not within the contract itself. Another difference is um, between the B101 and the master agreement is how substantial and final completion are set up. So the B101 uh, is in effect through the life of the project and then of course any post contractual obligations. Whereas your master agreement, it's structured to be effective for one year. Uh, and, and Donovan mentioned this during uh, one of the earlier slides is uh, it's effective for one year and there's sort of an automatic renewal that occurs um, that evergreen clause, so to speak. And then unless either party gives notice more than 60 days prior to that yearly expiration date. So the, an easy way to think of it is it's sort of like a residential lease, so to speak, where you can, you can structure it where it automatically renews unless you give notice that it won't. Um, and then if a project under a service order is still proceeding, 
then the master agreement remains in effect through the completion of that service order, even though you might terminate the master agreement uh, writ large. And it's important to remember that each um, service order contains a commencement date and a substantial completion date for that, you know, that project or that phase of work. Um, another difference is the party's representatives. And again, this was touched on a little bit earlier, but under the B101, you're going to select a representative for the duration of the project. And under the B121, 221, you're going to select representatives in each service order. And those representatives are, um, are representatives for the duration of that service order. And then you're also going to select representatives for the purpose of the overall master agreement. Um, so, you know, they, the representatives for the overall master agreement, as, as Donovan was mentioning a little bit earlier, are the individuals who likely have a relationship with the client um, or who can make decisions related to the overall master agreement as opposed to just the scope of work that's in the service order. Um, one of the issues to think about is if there's something that's potentially um, borderline such that it might be considered related to a service order and it also might be considered related to the master agreement. So something like um, an escalation of fees, for example, uh, as, as it pertains to like negotiating a new service order or something like that. It might be a best practice and, you know, maybe a risk uh, mitigation tactic to perhaps involve both um, representatives, one for the master agreement and the one for the service order, if they're different uh, in those types of situations where um, you could have some overlap with respect to whether you're talking about the master agreement or the service order, just so that there's no confusion and, pretend, and no potential argument that whoever spoke didn't have the authority to do so, uh, or you know, whatever the case may be. So with respect to uh, payment, the B101, obviously payment is going to depend on your compensation type. And that's actually the same uh, as the master agreement and the service order. You're going to just select your compensation type. So stipulated sum, percentage cost of the work, um, or you know, there's always the other clause in your, or the option you can structure it however you like. The um, B101 and the master agreements also both have monthly payments uh, for services and ha have that, that schedule, uh, so it's relatively predictable. One of the nuanced differences is the B101 has a specific um, option to provide an initial payment to the contractor, whereas the master agreement service order structure uh, don't. You, you can include it, obviously. It's not in the standard language, but that sort of makes sense because you might you, know, you can't really include it in the master agreement necessarily, at least not in the standard language, because you don't really know um, whether or not there's even going to be a scope of work yet, um, even theoretically, at the time you negotiate a master agreement. And then with respect to your service orders, it might just, just might not be contemplated between the parties uh, for that particular uh, scope of work. So with that, I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Donovan to give a little bit of a, um, a primer on sort of turning and looking downstream a little bit toward the architect consultant set of documents. So the architect consultant master agreements and how those work. Donovan? Sure, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. We're gonna talk probably pretty, pretty generally. Um, as far as the master agreement and service order structure they're they're almost identical with with very similar with a, with really very similar uh terms in the service order and in the master agreement with with a few key differences that i'll point out but the idea here is that you would with your consultants negotiate a c421 which would serve as your uh, master agreement with your consultant and then work would be awarded uh, based on a C422, which is the service order, um, and and then that would be um, presumably for each master agreement you would have one, uh, one with each master agreement with each client you would have one master agreement with your um, with your consultants as well. Uh, 
I will point out on the next slide, if we will talk about some details, uh, the flow down clause is, is a unique clause. Um, and it's, of course, we're all familiar with it in the C-401 where the, uh, you know, the consultant assumes all the rights and obligations of the architect, um, assumes towards the architect rights and obligations that the um, architect has towards the owner. Uh, it's uh, it's interesting in the way the, the C-422 uh, is, I'm sorry, C-421 is set up in that it's actually structured that you could have multiple prime agreements um, and you could have one, one master agreement and have consultants who work across multiple prime agreements. Um, that's, that's a bit of a challenge in our experience to, to manage, but, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, the, the, the key clause in the C442 is the Article 7 Attachments and Exhibits Clause, which prompts users to actually attach the prime agreement that applies. So that's very important that um, when you're using the, the C442, in all circumstances, that you attach as Exhibit A uh, the, the prime agreement. Um, so, so that's really the only difference in, in uh, not a lot more to say about that. Um, so I think we're uh, just moving on to questions, right? Yeah, so we can pause here and I guess check in with Hosti to see if any questions have come in from our uh, attendees at this time. Uh, and then if not, Donovan, I might pick your brain for maybe a couple tips and tricks and horror stories or something like that about uh, <laughs> your experience with these. But first, let's check in with Hosti and see if we if we have any questions. Hasi? Great. Thank you, Jimmy and Donovan. Um, we do have questions coming into the chat, so I do urge everyone to take a moment to um, enter any questions that uh, our presenters can answer. The first question we have here is, I am currently using the B121-2014 um, for my on-call architect, but that version is no longer in use. I still have another year left on this master agreement. Can I use the B221-2018 for service orders under the B121-2014? Um, I can take this one, I think, Donovan, unless you specifically know the answer. I do not. <laughs> uh, so I guess my my answer would be I'm... I haven't done a line-by-line -line comparison of the 2014 version of these versus the 2018. Um, so I would say, um, I don't think there were a lot of differences. The easy way to do it would be on aiacontracts.org. Uh, all of our agreements that are updated have um, underneath them a comparison document that shows all of the changes that were made between that one and the prior version. So what you would wanna do is if you are um, using, you know, for example, the 221-2018 and in, incorporating a, uh, uh, or a 220, sorry, the 221-2018 versus the 121-2014, um, you would want to look at the comparison between the master agreement from 2014 and the master agreement of 2018 and see what changed, and then specifically look at your cross-references in the service order and just make sure that your cross references are all correct and that it's all, you know, it's incorporating the correct language and your, um, the intention that you want it to do. And then you'd have to, if, if there is differences, you have to make the modifications there. I would say that that's probably where to start. Um, and then of course, the other option would be just to update the master agreement to the 2018 version, uh, then everything would kind of flow more seamlessly. But um, I would understand if there's practical implications uh, in the way for doing that. Okay, another question. I think Donovan said the B121 isn't ideal for use on a project using different service orders for different phases of the project. For example, service order number one goes through schematic design and service order number two goes from design development through construction. What are the problems with this approach? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, when I say not ideal, it's probably more of a of an HOK specific issue. So for, for us, 
how we determine backlog is that we we only um, include contracted work, meaning that it has to be, you know, a signed written contract in order for that to be included in the backlog. So internally for our uh, teams who are, you know, every year our office, I mean, every month our offices are reporting um, new work, new backlog. They want to show that they, they have, um, you know, the work that is needed to keep and sustain the office. Uh, they're not able to report the full value of that contract. They can only report that piece of it that's been authorized. So, you know, that's probably more of an internal uh, structural issue than it is a problem with the document. The document would work fine for that. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if an owner wanted to do that, they, they could. Um, but I think for the architect, you know, there is a risk, and this has happened for, for architects, that we, you know, we get through design development and the owner then descopes and go and uh, rebids to another lower bid firm to do the CD. So, you know, it's, there, there's not an, a um, confidence that that work will be there for the duration of, of um, what, you, what you've contracted for in the master agreement. Great. Thank you, Donovan. Um, really helpful follow up on the backlog, though. Thank you. Um, is another comment that came in. Uh, those are all of the comments and questions that have come in thus far. Okay, uh, so I guess we'll, we'll just wait we on here maybe another 20, 30 seconds and see if any more roll in. And while we're doing that, uh, just show you up on your slide, up on your screen here. Uh, if you do have additional comments, uh, the contact information and additional resources are up on the page. Um, we do have two different um, sort of helplines, uh, a different email address and phone number. So if you have questions about the content of the documents, like the ones we've been answering so far, uh, you can contact us at docinfo at aicontracts.org or that phone number you're seeing. And then if you have questions about the online service, so you're trying to download something and it's not working or logging into the website, uh, you can contact us at tech support at aiacontracts.org. And then of course you can always visit aiacontracts.org slash learn. And there's a bunch of information on there, some guides, uh, those comparison documents that I referenced earlier. Um, and then also not on the screen, but I did want to give a plug to our uh, new and improved YouTube channel as well that has a lot of, uh, and constantly being added to, new videos uh, about our contracts and sort of answering basic questions about what certain terms mean, uh, working way through the documents, uh, how to use the documents, how they talk to each other, uh, et cetera. So you can give that a look, and it's maybe not as interesting as some other YouTube channels you might visit, but uh, it's helpful nonetheless. Uh, so with that, I guess I'll turn it back over to Hotsi to see if we have any other questions, and if not, you can close us out. Great. Thanks again, Jimmy. Um, I just wanted to remind attendees that you will receive the PowerPoint and recording from today's session uh, by Monday. We'll also be placing uh, this recording on our Learn page. We do recommend you check our Learn page out because there is a lot of on-demand education. Your credit for attending this will be uh, reported within two business weeks. There looks like uh, there are no other questions. So with that, I want to thank our presenters for providing this thorough and excellent presentation. And thank you to the attendees for your interest in attending today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Hot.